The NTSB preliminary reports are out on two runway excursions, runway overruns, providing a couple of more teachable moments here on the Blanco Lirio channel. If somebody says go around on the flight crew, go around. Go around first, ask questions later. And if you're not on a stabilized approach, go around. First, let's start with a Cessna citation that overran the end of the runway at Mayfield, Kentucky by over 700 feet and striking this house, nearly knocking this house off of its foundation. The accident was back on 18 September at 1640 local time. Uh, Cessna 525C citation November 577 Romeo Tango operating under FAR Part 91 repositioning flight. According to the pilot, the airplane had just completed maintenance at the St. Louis Regional Airport, St. Louis, Illinois, and the purpose of the flight was to return to Mayfield Graves Airport where it was based. The pilot reported that uh, up to the event, everything was uneventful. During the initial descent to Mayfield, the pilot reported that he deployed the speed brakes to begin slowing the airplane. We'll take a look at the ADSB data in a moment. To begin slowing the airplane and to assist with the descent, the pilot set up for a straight in visual approach runway 19, a 5,002 foot long, 100 foot wide asphalt runway. While on approach, the speed brakes remained deployed. He was trying to get the thing slowed down. And when the airspeed, when the airplane speed was below 200 knots indicated airspeed, the pilot extended the landing gear. When the airplane speed was below 160 knots indicated airspeed, the pilot stowed the speed brakes and configured the airplane for landings, for landing, getting the flaps out. The pilot further stated that while he configured the airplane for landing, quote, later than intended, the airplane was still fully configured and stabilized for a visual approach to land at uh, Mayfield. Well, let's go take a look at that ADSB data and see how stabilized this approach was. So you mean to tell me that you're telling accident investigators that this preliminary ADSB data is indicating that you were at an a um, GPS altitude of 1,375 feet and 207 knots, just 1.8 miles from the end of the runway. That's nearly 100 knots above your approach speed for this particular approach to this particular runway and well above the desired altitude. On Google Earth, we can see the descent on in. Zoom in on it, here is the runway. And kind of an interesting viewpoint, well, here's the side view. And then here's the view from the jet. Okay, there's the runway and here's your flight path on in. There's no way you're gonna make that approach and landing from that altitude and that speed over 200 knots, 1.8 miles from the end of the runway. This was a single pilot operation. This is high time to go around. The pilot reported the airplane touched down on the runway center line and he deployed the ground spoilers and pressed firmly on the brakes. However, he observed no braking action as the airplane continued to roll down the runway. Sounds like he's trying to blame it on a mechanical problem. Remember on the Cessna Citation jet, your emergency braking procedures, if your brakes are not working, you need to pull on the emergency brake and deploy the nitrogen bottle, which will deploy the brakes without anti-skid capability, but will get the aircraft stopped using emergency brakes, which is a nitrogen bottle, which backs up your normal brakes. There is no indication that the pilot was reaching for the emergency brakes. The pilot applied greater force to the brakes, however, the airplane began to veer to the right and there was still no observed slowing of the airplane. The pilot determined that there was insufficient runway for a go-around and decided to continue to roll down the runway with the engines at idle, continuing to press firmly on the brakes, correcting the airplane back toward the runway centerline and applying downward force to the yoke. The airplane rolled off the end of the runway and went through the airport's perimeter fence, crossed a road and impacted a house. The airplane was retained for further examination. They'll be looking closely at the braking system and see if there was, in fact, anything wrong with the aircraft's braking system. The weather was fine and the winds were light and the runway was dry. Next, let's take a look at the Embraer 145, which made good use of the EMAS, Engineered Materials Arresting System, off of the end of 
Roanoke's runway 34. This accident occurred back on September 24th, 2117 local time, so a nighttime approach and landing. An Embraer 145XR November 21129er experienced a runway excursion while landing at the Roanoke, Virginia airport. The airport overran the end of runway 34 and came to rest in the EMAS, the Engineered Materials Resting System. There were no injuries to the three crew and 50 passengers on board the airplane. And get this, there was no damage to the airplane. That stuff works. And this, of course, was operating under FAR Part 121, an airline operation. So this was the second leg of a four-day trip. And the first leg uh, on the incident airplane, not sure what they mean by that. Prior to departure, the airplane had to be deplaned twice for maintenance-related anomalies, and they don't elaborate as to what that was. After boarding for a third time, the flight crew reviewed the weather and briefed the thunderstorms that were approaching their destination. The airplane pushed back approximately two and a half hours after the scheduled departure time, so they're running late. En route, the flight crew got the ATIS information for their destination, and the ATIS reported calm winds, no precip, and a cloud ceiling of 15,000 feet and runway 6 in use. The captain, who was the pilot flying, briefed the localizer approach to runway 6. The FO was the pilot monitoring, suggested reviewing the landing performance details for a wet runway or a RCC code of 5, but the captain declined due to the ATIS not reporting precipitation. So there's thunderstorms en route, but it's not wet yet, according to the ATIS. Each airline has a very specific uh, operational procedure for when you have to specifically determine your landing distance. And most airlines nowadays have an app for that for your particular aircraft. And unless conditions are perfect, if there's anything different going on with your landing runway, you then need to do the actual landing assessment and determine the actual landing distance. And one of those that normally triggers a review of your landing distance is a wet runway. During descent, the flight crew checked in with approach control and was, was informed of precipitation along the approach path to runway 6 and that other aircraft were using runway 34 for landing. The captain requested the FO set up for the uh, ILS to 34 and brief the approach. The FO set up the ILS 34 approach, briefed the approach changes, and monitored the weather radar. Here's the airport at Roanoke. So they're originally going to come on in here to runway 6, right here, the 6,800 foot long runway. But now there is a fairly late change in the game to switch over to runway 34, which is a bit shorter, 5,810 feet. And here is the EMAS located off the end of the runway. Here's the ILS approach for runway 34. 109.7 and 336 for an inbound course with your minimums down here. After turning on final, the flight crew observed the runway and heard the previous landing aircraft report marginal visibility and bumpy conditions. During the approach, the rain intensity increased. All right, you're about to get a wet runway. And the captain requested that the FO run to the performance calculations and landing on a wet runway with RCC of five. So now you want me to do it. In, <laughs> Along with everything else changing the approach and the last minute changes, the first officer is getting very busy. The FO ran the performance calculations and determined that they would have a margin of approximately 200 feet more than was required. That's a pretty thin sounding margin to me. And that was um, without thrust reverser usage. There's certain parameters that these calculations take into account or do not take into account. The captain briefed the go-around procedures and they would divert to Piedmont Greensboro, North Carolina, if they executed a go-around. So at least they were thinking about a go-around, plan B. On short final, the rain intensity increased, and the captain requested the windshield wipers on to high. Windshield wipers have a low and high setting, and their effectiveness is mm, sometimes pretty marginal. It just smears the rain around sometimes. As the airplane descended below 500 feet, the FO observed that they were High on the PAPI indicators, the precision approach path indicators, so they were a little too high, and then observed the captain correcting the flight path, but recalled they were still high as the airplane crossed the threshold. After crossing the runway markings, the FO called for a go-around, but the captain continued. 
It's a no-fault go-around policy at the airlines. If anybody on the crew, and this is brief beforehand, anybody on the crew can call a go-around and the crew will go around and they'll debate the reasons for the go-around call-out later. But in this case, the captain ignored the FO. About halfway down the runway, the FO called for a go-around a second time, but the captain continued. The airplane touched down, the flight crew applied maximum braking and deployed the engine thrust reversers. The airplane overran the end of the runway and came to the rest came to a rest in the EMAS. And the FO attempted to communicate with ATC, but the communications button had disengaged. There was a bit of a kerfuffle there with the communications. After engaging the communications button, the FO coordinated with ATC and contacted the flight attendant, and the flight attendant verified that there were no injuries. The flight crew completed the emergency evacuation checklist and prepared for an evacuation. ARF personnel boarded the airplane and assisted with evacuating the passengers down a ladder. Weather at the time of the accident was IMC night with few clouds at 3,200 feet, broken at 4,900 feet, five knots of wind out of the west, and 1.75 miles of visibility. By the way, here's what they mean by the runway condition assessment matrix or an RCC or a runway condition reading of five, the number five indicates a wet runway with good braking action. And these numbers range from six to a perfectly dry runway to zero, uh, no braking action at all. No injuries and no damage to the aircraft. Teachable moment. When somebody says go around, you go around. If you're not on a stabilized approach, you go around. So I often get the question, what happens to the crew or the captain in this particular case in a situation like this? Well, I don't really know. It's hard to tell. It depends on the company. These are union jobs. The pilots are protected by the union. There are some union protections involved. I'm sure there will be some training, retraining. The captain may even go back to becoming an FO, a first officer for a while until they the company may, maybe creates a training program specifically for this one individual if they so deem so necessary. It's, it's rare that they would simply just lose their job right away after an incident like this in the airlines. As far as what happens to the citation pilot who looks like he moved this house slightly off of its foundation, I have no idea. These are not union protected jobs. Maybe some of you, uh, Part 135 guys can uh, explain how that process works for Part 135 pilots. It's a pretty small network of pilots. Everybody knows everybody. A successful outcome to a landing always starts with a stabilized approach and landing. And remember, you got to be on speed, fully configured, at least 500 feet, and maintain a stabilized approach on glide path all the way from 500 feet on in. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.